she's got. I think she's got a either a job offer or going to be at the hospital. Right. I'm ready. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Can you guys online hear me? Say yes. Yes. Anyway, so yes. Come to our bear range in Nigeria. We find her in. She's a great friend, my mentor, and more. Uh, but Dave Bonner, so Dave Bonner is a professor and director of the Richard Gardner Digital Research, Research Center. Both the stations born in Virginia. Dave was born and raised in Texas. He went to Illinois State University for his bachelor's degree and master's program. And he started in the University of Kentucky. He has published what, 80 articles. Seven seasons, so a lot of stuff. So his research program focuses on uh, for production, production of this gas. Okay, take it away. Thanks for coming. Thank you very much, and uh, also I'd like to take the opportunity to thank the Bear Ranch Foundation for. Uh, Putting this on, I think it's a great thing, and and also Chris, as well for the good communication and and getting me here. Tried to get me here, I think last term or semester, and didn't work out for schedules. But glad I could be there. And when Rodrigo initially re, uh, reached out to me, he wanted, he said, ah, just come and talk about some research you got going on. What'll what'll work? And I mentioned the virtual fence stuff because that has really uh, gotten a lot of interest. In the last couple of years, um, a lot of people, a lot of agencies, a lot of organizations, a lot of states have reached out to us and we we're not the only group working on it. I'm going to present some of that information, uh, but there's a, there's going to be a lot more coming out. There is a lot of people working with virtual fence right now and a lot of state and federal agencies that are considering it uh, in their land management. And I hopefully I'll present a little bit of that information and leave some time for some discussion uh, to get get on with that. As we know, traditional fencing, for those of you that have or have not done it, uh, it's not fun and it's expensive, okay? Traditionally, what, what do we have? We have barbed wire or, or netting fence. Sometimes if the pasture or the situation works, we can use electric, uh, but those don't work all the time and you always gotta either move them, take them down or repair them. And, and that does cost a lot of money. Uh, I've gotten three bids for fencing in both Southeast Oregon and Northeast Oregon uh, for some work we have to do over the next few few months. And those bids have ranged from 13 grand to 40,000 a mile, okay, that we're looking at. The 13 is looking good. I hope that wasn't a mistake and that's for all uh, supplies because the other bid was 19. Um, so we're looking at a fairly substantial amount of money to put fencing in per mile when you look at that cost, okay? And that doesn't even get into this bottom line. And I don't know how many of you that have worked with public lands or maybe even just on some of your private lands that you may have to deal with, but there can be a lot of other procedural, logistical, just management challenges, getting people to do it, okay? Even finding people to present a bid sometimes is difficult. NEPA process, archeological clearances, uh, those are all challenges that we face with traditional fencing. Do they work? Yeah. Do they not work? Yeah. Do they leave gates open? There's problems um, as we get into there, but that's what we have used in the past. I mentioned virtual fencing. What is it? Okay. It's just who in here has everybody seen the, the invisible fence that they use for dogs? Okay. And then, you know, and they have that one setting stubborn dog for those that'll go through it. You'll see we have stubborn cows as well. It, at times, but it's basically a, a type of behavioral modification that we use to affect where cattle go. And we do that with both audio and electrical stimulus. Okay, so they do learn and I'll show some of that as, as we get there. So what, why is it going to be useful? It's less logistically challenging. Okay, we can use a satellite. To program that collar to work in certain areas. Okay, you don't have to go out there and build a fence up and down that hill or that cliff or the repairing area, whatever you're you're looking at. It's less labor intensive. Okay. It's going to give you a ton of management flexibility, which I'm I'm hoping that I'll give you that idea as we go through and look at it. And the one thing that a lot of producers like, 
you know, from a research side, it's also useful. Well, the technology that we're using right now is real time. I know where my cattle are right now. I can look at them and see where they're at and what they're doing. And, um, and I put situation dependent there. I really do believe it's cost effective already, depending on the situation. Um, and we can talk more about that as we get there, but I think this is 1 of those things that's going to really take off. Um, as we move forward from a management perspective. What is fenceless fencing? Okay. It's not a new concept. I don't want you to think of that. It's been used a long time. I know Tim did some work on uh, the hall ranch up in northeast Oregon. A long time ago with what these proximity type sensors. Okay. They worked, but they also had problems. Right, you have to be within proximity of them. Climatic conditions can affect it. Battery life, weight, retention. Um, those are all things that. It showed the potential even back. This is what almost 30 years ago now, 20, 20 years ago now. That 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 kind of work was being done, but yet. Didn't really take off for a variety of reasons. Some of you may know Dean Anderson. Okay, Dean Anderson is. You want to call him that the father of virtual fence. He was at New Mexico with the ARS group down there for a long time. This is actually one of the, could you imagine what, what would you think you turn that out? Right? Okay. There, nothing would happen. I, I can tell you, they'd be fine. Um, but that is some of the older technology. We have gotten much better technologies improved and, uh, you'll see some of what we're, we're using. How does the system work now? The one that at least that we're using personally, this is a schematic. Of that technology and basically we have the collar that's on the cow. Okay, and it's going to talk just like a handheld GPS system. It's going to talk with a satellite to determine where it's at on the earth. Then that collar is going to talk with communication gateway, a tower. That has to have in this instance. This tower has cell service. Okay, then that cell service is going to go to the cloud and then back to our computer or smartphone. And this is two way at this point, because we can program that collar from my phone or from. The desktop to move cow. Or to see where they're at or to activate that collar or turn it off. Okay. There is no in the ones we're using no onboard storage. Okay. And how does it work? I mean, you think of virtual fence, really, you can think of it as two ways. We want to keep them in an area or we're going to keep them out of an area. And how that is done, it's not as simple as putting up a fence. And I hope that is clear is we have to set up this technology to succeed. And by doing so, how we set up those virtual fences. Determine if it's going to be successful or not. And how we set them up is dependent on if we're keeping them out or we're keeping them in. Okay. These are the three years of technology that we've been using in our research group. This is the first edition of the collar. Um, rig thick rubber. If you were to take it off the cow, it would flop out straight. Okay. There was a lot of tension on that. And there was a buckle. It was a pain in the rear to adjust to size. And when you're putting it on any number of cattle, it wasn't fun. Uh, but it worked. This is the one we used last year. Much easier to put on. I apologize for how dark it is, but can you see there's two little probes right there? That's the, that's what does the shocking. And, th and then it has the, uh, the, the audio. It's got a speaker on it as well. These were much easier to adjust. They put buckles on them instead of clips. And so we were able to get those on a little bit easier. I have not used this one yet. This is what we have for this year. I'm a little concerned. Um, for a couple of reasons, retention, they're going, these are, I think, you know, it's got a safety thing. If a cattle breaks it, you know, we'll look at it. But what the company's recommending is using zip ties. So I'm like, okay, I've got to rethink this a minute on how we're going to do it. But the reason they did this is ease of application and also for shock, because these are your two shocks here, right? So you got a ground, one's going to be a ground, one's going to be hot. And so that's the way that's going to work, but the, their technology is progressing as well. They're learning because to make it more useful for the producer. The tower that I showed you, and this is some adjustment that we've done. This is what the company provided. 
basically it is a stationary object that needs cell coverage and that's what's going to talk to uh the collars now this works if you're in flat ground right i mean it's line of sight if we want to think of it that way and you've got cell coverage the problem is these are about depends on the around 12 grand 10 or 12 grand for this and it, but you could do a, a huge area but what how do you move it okay so we modified it we went and bought a little trailer and put it on a trailer and this is actually at our experimental range. That's what it looks like when we're hauling it. And this is uh, actually Skip Nyman and I, the ranch manager and I, putting it up. Um, it's on that trailer. You just put some panels around it to keep the cows from destroying it. And now we're on a higher point. And now you can kind of see we're going to get a lot more coverage, right? Being able to talk to the talk to the collar and and do it and portable. We can move it around. Because if somebody wants to put that kind of money in a tower, you don't want it locked in one spot. We want, at least I don't. I want to be able to move it. Okay, now, the other thing about that tower, and this is, there's good support from the company. Because you can't just get this technology and think you're going to do it by yourself. You're going to have to work with it. Because for us, this is, Tim and Sam may recognize this little map. That's the Hall Ranch, Northeast Oregon. And... I'm going to be doing a study out there this coming uh, summer. And I needed to find out where the best place for those towers are to make it work. Because number one, if you just drive down the highway, there's no internet there. Or I'm sorry, no cell coverage there. But there are some locations on that ranch that have cell coverage. And one is right here. And one is up here. Okay, so I sent those coordinates via Google Earth to the company. The company gave me a map. The green is the coverage that putting a tower up here at a coal tree will give me coverage where the green is. If I put it up here at the top of pasture B, then I get coverage down here. And if I use two towers, they overlap, I get that kind of coverage. So this isn't flat ground. Okay. So this is going to give me quite a bit of coverage. I'm going to do a repairing study. We'll talk about it later. So I'm going to get pretty much the complete repairing area covered. Now, if I didn't have this coverage from the tower, does that mean it's not going to work? No. That means I have to program the collars before I turn the cows out. Because the collar will talk to the satellite. The satellite tells it where it's at. The programming that is on board on that collar, the programming, will then keep the cattle in or out of that area. But this just gives us flexibility of seeing day to day where the cattle are and how, how the management works. Real time, this is a screenshot I took off my computer as we were running to one of the studies I'm gonna talk about today. <laughs> this is our working facility. The three, those are uh, leftover Rodrigo cows from when he was in Burns. They're not, they didn't work. But uh, actually those were bad collars. So they stayed, those, those cattle stayed there and these, we ran down this way and walked them up, and then we had the fence off at that time, and we ran them into what, this was a fire break that we created. But I could watch the riders moving the cattle as we went. Kind of a cool thing, this to be able to see, uh, illustrating that real-time potential to look at where your cattle are. Okay, what are the opportunities that we have there? Um, this is one of the first year studies when we put the, the collars on the cows. One, and, and I know Montana is a public land state, just like Oregon is. You know, when you have a fire that runs through an allotment, public land agencies are going to tell you you can't get out there and graze for probably two years minimum, unless you can fence those areas, right? And fencing sometimes is hard. All the logistical problems that I talked about initially get out there that are hard to deal with. This will allow us one of the, this is a tool that might allow us to graze that because we could restrict where the cattle go. We could also protect uh, repairing areas, sensitive areas. So those areas that we don't want the cattle to graze. Cattle location, I've already mentioned. We can also, there's some work out of Oklahoma where they're using this same technology to herd cattle through like a, a, a summer grazing system using the, the collars to actually move them and rotate the cattle through through those places. 
And then the other, and this was actually done in uh, Nevada. Um, there was a study on some public lands where they did not have cell coverage. They just programmed the callers. They were using this technology successfully to avoid um, some larkspur areas that where they were losing a lot of cattle when they grazed it early early season. Putting these collars on, they basically eliminated eliminated that because they kept the cattle away from that area for that early season before they before Larkspur dried up. So there's some technology, and then how much do cattle cost? You know, you look at being able to not turn out. There's a lot of logistical things you have to calculate to determine economics, but it is working. And this is a producer that actually did that, by the way. This wasn't necessarily research, even though research was occurring. The producer paid for it in order for that to happen. Okay. And this is some work out of Australia, actually looking at the technology just to show you, because some of the questions are, okay, you train them, these cows, or the cattle, and they go out and they're on the riparian area. This is a riparian area, by the way. And maybe you can keep them out, but then how fast or how long does that learning, is it maintained? How long can they, uh, are they always gonna be scared and not go into that, back into that spot? What are they, th this is what these researchers looked at. So this is no virtual fence. Collars were not turned on in this area for seven days. They activated the, the fence for 10 days. Did a pretty darn good job of keeping the lion's share of those cattle out of where this side, right? You can see some dots, but not many. Stubborn cow. Okay, that's what we were getting into. Then they turned it off for the next six days, and the cattle went right back out. So they learned, you know, that that audio sound and the electric cue, I don't need to go over there. But as soon as that was turned off, they went back. So it was, it was fairly transient on, on that kind of knowledge. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about what we've been doing um, at the Eastern Oregon Ag Research Center. And it's not just me. I'm just one small proponent of the, or component of this group. Um, on the state side, Juliana Ranches, Beef Extension Specialist, and Dustin Johnson, State Range Specialist, and I uh, are with Oregon State. And then on the USDA RS side of our group, we have Chad Boyd, the research leader, Roy O'Connor, and Kirk Davies, who are rangeland scientists. Um, and these next three studies that I'm going to talk about, uh, we, we were all, uh, parts of that, uh, in order to make it happen. The 3 studies that we did, we looked at cow behavior. We wanted to see, you know, just initially what effect. From a welfare standpoint and behavioral, how long it lasts, how fast, uh, cattle learn things. We wanted to see that from the behavior standpoint. Uh, we also looked at keeping cattle out of a burned area. The example I gave you just a minute ago, we had. Uh, no, I'll talk about it when we get there, but we burned an area and we tried to exclude cattle from it. And then we took it up a next step to see, could we actually construct a fire break? Could we even remove fine fuels at a level that would stop a fire from running? And could cattle be kept in that area for a length of time in order to get it done? So this is the behavior study. Um, this is in translational animal science for a proceedings paper that Juliana uh, was the lead author on that came out last year. Uh, the study design, they used 11 Angus Hereford cows um, that we put in there that had not had collars on before. So these were naive. Uh, we had two management zones. We had the auditory zone and the electric zone because they learn that when they hear that sound, trigger something, and then if they keep going, they're going to get shocked. Right. Alfalfa hay was the attractant. Okay, so these were done in the morning. They weren't fed that morning so that we could see they wanted to eat. So there was a drive to get to that alfalfa. And then we collected these variables, which I'll talk about in just a minute. This was the testing area. We'd run them out, run them in, see how long we did. Five runs, collar off, three runs with the collar on, and then uh, another run with the collar off. And that's this is some of the results that you can see here. The first run was the collar wasn't active. Okay. So the eating time, half their time was spent eating when, when they got turned in, roughly. And then running and trotting, jumping, you can read as well as I can, or hopefully the people on the computer can can see or online can see the, the writing as well. Bucking running and the time in the virtual fence zone where they shouldn't be. 
they spend about 63% of their time in there. Well, we turned the collars on and did it again. Okay, turned them in. Now they only spend about 3% of their time eating, well, almost 4% of their time eating. And you can see very agitated type response when that happened. You could imagine, didn't know what was there. Okay, we pulled them out and then we did others and then we brought them back in later with the collars on. Third run, fourth run, and then the fifth run, we turned them off. And I know this is a big data slide. Okay, there's really two components there that I want you to, to look at, even though there's a lot of statistical stuff in there. Look at eating time. Collar off 47.7, collar on 3.8, 1.34, and 24% when it was off. Collar was working, it was keeping them out. Maybe not perfect, but it was working. Now, the time in the virtual fence zone, very similar. Okay, and it kept going down. They were learning that they don't need to get there because it's going to hurt me, right? Or shock me. Okay, and then this, that basically is shown here. When I look at the three runs where the collars were on, okay, the black is the auditory stimulus, the orange is the electric stimulus. So, quite a bit there of auditory, and this is the number of events that occurred. So, quite a bit of auditory, electrical, but then it decreased over time, right? By run four, they were, they pretty much had figured it out that fast. They knew that they didn't need to be there. That's why they weren't in there and that they didn't get that auditory or the electrical stimulus. So what was their conclusion that we saw there? Uh, we, we, it, we think it can be effective in keeping cattle out of an area that they're wanting to be drawn to. Um, and that behavior was it permanent? You know, they would go back to it pretty quick. Like that run five, those cattle were went back to the and started eating. There was a little hesitancy, but they went back. And also, like that study that I showed you from Australia, they did the same thing. You know, that they learned that when they don't hear something, it's okay. When I hear something, I need to stand stand back. Okay. The next study I wanted to talk about was that one about the burned area. Okay. And this is was published just this year in uh, Rangeland Ecology and Management. Chad Boyd uh, was the lead author on this one that we did. And what we did, this was at our experimental range, actually, from where that tower that when I was showing the towers, it was actually in that area. You could see this area from that tower spot. We had, these are five acre small paddocks that the previous fall, we had burned about 30% of these pastures. So we burned that, if you want to think of it as north, the north half of these pastures. Uh, the previous fall. And then in June, we came in and allocated the cattle were trained to the collars. So they already knew how to respond to those collars. And we had controls or virtual fence active. So all of the cows, we put three cows in each pasture and they were in there for about 14 days. Okay. And what we ended up looking at was um, the, how many, uh, their behavior, but more importantly, we wanted to see their location. Was it able to keep them out of that burned area? And three cows, collars on all the cows. They were only active on the virtual fence side. Uh, these paddocks are in their hard fences on the ends and the partitions. Okay, there was not obviously a hard fence here. It was just burned. So this is actually all the data from those GPS collars that we pulled. Five minute. They were five minute readings every day for 14 days on those three cats. Okay. Ooh. No, that wasn't. I made that one happy, so she left. But um, blue dots being those cows that were controlled, the collar wasn't active. The white had the virtual fence active. Um, this is the burned area, obviously. And then there would have been an audio cue in this range and then the electric. Q starting right there. And what we ended up do, seeing there, it worked, but it wasn't perfect. Okay, there, there were some cows that went in. There's a lot more white in here. Why? We had one collar that we didn't get fitted right. And when it started shocking, she, it inverted. She was shaking her head, the collar inverted. So then it was like, woohoo, I'm just hearing this weird noise. 
and she was in there and eating in the grass while her friends and she that has a tendency to want to pull cattle or gregarious wanted to pull pull her friends with her and so what we ended up doing we saw that the first day we pulled it fixed the collar and then you'll see the data in a minute that solved that problem okay so it's technology it's not perfect but visually i think this does a pretty good job of showing you this technology has some potential application. Okay. So this is just a graph showing the number of cattle proportion of cattle locations within the burn. Okay. This being the virtual fence collars, this being the control. This big blip is because of that inverted collar. What we had. But essentially they never went in there after the second day. They stayed out. Whereas the control cows, they preferred to be in the burn, but then left. Why'd they leave? They ate it all. You'll see that in a minute. It was pretty high utilization. So then there was no ice cream left on that end. So then they had to go back to the broccoli on, on the far end. And, and that's kind of what we see here. This is the unburned area. This is the burned area. The black being the control that did not have the virtual fence collar the, are on. And the gray being the virtual fence being active, the unburned where they both had access to without any negative consequence, um, they ate well. But the the virtual fence collar spent more time in there because they had to. Okay. Now in the burned area, this is utilization. It was right at seventy percent utilization of those burned grasses, which is not. That's why the agencies don't want you in there. This is why the negative consequence. Of turning into on no burn, they're going to hammer it, and then it was gone. Then they went back to the other side. The burn cattle, not much. It was about three percent of the time. Why? Part of it was the inverted collar, but there were some that would go and then have to come back because the collars would bring them back. This is a visual of those pastures. Okay, can you tell which one? What cattle were allowed into, and which one wasn't? Okay, this is burn. This is the virtual fence. This is the control. They got hit pretty, pretty hard okay, from that 14 days. So why did we see there? We know it's not perfect, but it drastically reduced the amount of time that those cattle spent in that burned area. The virtual fence did. But that was five acres and three cows. Okay, so let's be careful what we're trying to recommend there. We need to look on larger landscapes okay, and that'll be this next study that I'm going to show you right now. And that's a fire break. Anybody fought fire before on there? Done it? Okay, it's not fun. Um, anybody helped build a fire break before? Okay, you have. What's one of the first things that you want to have for a fire break? Right? Access. <laughs> so a road is one of the primary things that we looked at, right? So what we ended up doing was looking at an area on our experimental range that had fuel loads, that had a road that we could use that would be a, an example of what would be utilized for a land management process to build a fire break, access, everything else. So this is what we designed. This is a three kilometer long path. There's a road that runs, you can kind of see that white line. So the road runs through most of it. We did multiple virtual fences. So don't think of the virtual fence as one. We have the technology. We put four virtual fences here. Okay. So they get through one, and you think it's okay, but then they're hit now with another audio cue and stimulatory cue. They get through that, they're hit with another auditory cue. So in other words, you know, it's not an, it's they can't stubborn dog it through, like I was saying, right? They're gonna have to do multiple layers of that, setting it up to be successful. On do it. And these are one way gates. So the unique thing about these collars, they can go one way, they can't go the other. Or they're getting, let me rephrase that. They can go, they could go into the fire break without any stimulus at all. Going out, they're gonna get audio and electrical stimulus. So there's a lot of math and, and uh, calculus involved in that that's beyond me, but that's why this com the companies were developed. The other thing we did, there's no external water source in this pasture. We provided water within the fire break. The cattle have to come back into the fire break, the one way gate. We're setting it up to be successful, right? 
we have to think about that when we're designing any virtual fence study. Um, target utilization we looked at based on some of the recommendations from the uh, rural fire protection associations and just some of the work that we've done in general on what fuel loads we need for carrying the fire with what we have here. We're looking for a 45% utilization level. We grazed about a month. Um, and we had a mixture of cow calf pears and dry cows that we ran in there. Not by choice. Well, I guess it was by choice, but we just didn't have enough pears to run in um, that were not out. So we ended up using that and it was, we found something with that that was pretty unique, which I'll show you here in a minute. Um, there's that tower. The tower would actually be located right here. One tower was able to do this whole study. Um, when you see, this is where we trained and kept them. You can see all the tight, they were in, a, in our corrals there at our headquarters um, on the experimental range. You can see where we rode them down and then we ran them in the corner right here and we put them in and they were in there for a month. Did a pretty good job of keeping them in. I mean, visually you can see what it did. We had a few escapees that went down here to the south and a couple that went out to the north. When we actually looked at utilization, and this is landscape appearance, we hit that almost 45% about right. You know, just under 50% inside the fire break. Outside, we only had about a 5.5% utilization when we looked at it. This is the interesting information that came out of it. Sometimes you see things that you didn't expect or when you looked at it. This is all the cattle. The black line is the portion of time that all those cattle spent in the fire break. And it, you know, we're, we're sitting around 80, 85, 90% dropped a little bit around in here. So still pretty successful the way it worked. Look at our dry cows. Almost 100% of the time they stayed in. And I, I should point this out. This is the green is when the animals receive pressure proportion of time and orange is the amount of time they were outside the fire break. And they should have been inside. Same way down here. Down here worked pretty good. Now look at the pears. And I apologize for where that picture's at, but it probably doesn't affect what you're looking at. The pears kind of bounced around a little bit and by the end of the study, by by a month out, they were as likely to be inside as outside. Why? There's a couple of reasons. One Predominantly, the calves are saying, I'm done in here, right? So the cows are following the calves. But the other thing is, if you really think about it, that was of 100 and however many meter, 100 and I think it was 150 roughly yard fire break, three kilometers long. It's a lot harder to keep cattle in a small area than to keep them out of an area. That makes sense? Because you're trying to keep animals in and they see grass right there. Right? When we're keeping them out is harder. So I think that is weighing in. The calf thing is definitely something we're going to look at down the road. And, and you'll see that because it's, I don't think it's, Chad and I will agree to disagree. Or, no, we won't disagree. We, we have a different matter of opinion right now on, on if it's going to be like that all the time or if it's just because of that narrow little area that we were trying to keep them out of. So the conclusion there definitely shows tool is a, our potential as a tool for livestock management. I think this is real for strategic livestock management, precision livestock. I think this is something that's really going to work. Um, but it's not an iron gate. It's not perfect. We have to, and I, I, I want to keep saying that the more we're learning about, we, we can't just throw a fence because we want it there. We have to think about cattle behavior. We have to think about the landscape and we have to set the tool up to be successful. Okay. That, that's really important. And that's, basically what I said there and talk about some future work that we're talking about. Brady Allred was here last week, right? Okay. We're working with him. And did he talk about the rap model? I bet he did while he was here. Okay. Um, this is actually some rap model data on our experimental range where we held it. Okay. Or where we did the studies that I just showed you. Okay. The red being areas that have high fuel loads that we could strategically put what they call a pod. I don't know if you talked about pods or not, but, but we could put, try to keep cattle in this area to reduce that fuel load, put cattle in here to reduce that fuel load, put cattle in here to reduce that fuel load and use virtual fence technology 
to keep them out, not hard fences. So we try to get them there, provide water, but can we reduce twofold? One, can we keep the cattle in there? And number two, will the RAP model be sensitive enough to measure that change? Because there's what, 15 day lag, I think, with the RAP model. So that when we look, so that is what, that's, that study is gonna go on this summer. Okay, so we're doing that in collaboration with uh, University of Montana um, to, to try to do that in Brady Alder. Then um, some of the work that I showed you at the Hall, uh, at the Hall Ranch, we're gonna be looking at, that's in Northeast Oregon, looking at trying to keep cattle out of the repairing area. With this technology, we're gonna provide offsite water or upland water. We're gonna pump water, uh, provide a water location away from the stream. And this is critical salmonic habitat, okay? So it's a, there's a lot of spawning activity that goes on and there's an interest in that. I'm not that familiar with Montana, but I'm assuming it will be very similar. In a lot of these areas, you gotta worry about stubble height, you gotta worry about bank alteration, you gotta worry about shrimp use. Those are the three big keys for us that will kick me out of an allotment if it's got a repairing area that's critical habitat. And so what I'm gonna be looking at there is, is can we reduce the amount of time that cattle spend in the repairing area looking at those three metrics primarily. And we're also gonna look at upland use as well. We're gonna throw that in. But the main thing that I wanna be able to do is say, okay, with virtual fence technology versus without, I'm able to keep cattle out of there without having to have a repairing fence, traditional fence, and gain increased grazing time. So that's what we're looking there. Then the other thing we're gonna do is a cow-calf behavior study. Because in that study, I should have said the calves didn't have collars, right? So they were able to go where they wanted because first off the collars didn't fit the calves, these new ones may, but then it gets into an economic standpoint too with those having to have those collars for calves. We'll look at that cow-calf behavior and what may affect that. We're gonna try to do that this summer. And then we're working with a, been working with a number of ranches, but primarily one in Central Oregon, the six shooter ranch is actually put this technology on the fall to look at cattle location and try to keep them out because they've got a free ranging bison issue. Y'all don't have that in Montana, I don't think. Um, that is messing up fences and their cattle are getting out and they got trespass issues and, and everything else. So they're trying to do that to help. And we're gonna use that as part of an outreach effort of when we're, lo we're looking at, at those. So, and that's what I've got. Um, I know it's gotten a lot of interest. I've been on two phone calls um, earlier this week, actually, with Forest Service expressing interest in this. And, and I mean, we're getting calls all the time because as the information gets out, we're one of the groups that's getting talked to. There's a virtual fence group that is being organized out of the Arizona, which we're participating in. We've got our group. Um, there's the group in Oklahoma, which is also participating in the Arizona group. There's a group out of Mo Wyoming, a group out of Montana. There, we're not the only ones doing this. I don't want to make it seem that way. I'm just highlighting some of the stuff we're doing and the potential of it, because I do think it has potential. It's, the price is not that horrible, um, especially when you look at what fencing costs. And then I think there's going to be opportunity, especially on a lot of the public allotments, where I think there's going to be cost shares, guys. I mean, when you start looking at the landscape tools that are available here for us and that can help us and show the benefit, and I'm going to show my bias here of cattle grazing um, and what we can use to help with landscape management, reduce catastrophic wildfires. You know, if we can keep them out of the repairing area, help in re uh, restoration pro practices, we could argue that that's going to generate cost shares and that'll even reduce it even more for the producer. So with that, I don't know how much time if I went over or not. I think we're good. 20 minutes. So, yep. Bach. So, what are the costs? Depends who you are. No, I mean, it, 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 it does actually. I'm being a little bit. Uh, depends on the number of callers on support because you do need the support from the company. So, if you're, you have 10 heads, I mean, Got hundred, probably hundred heads. It's gonna work. The towers, they have two covers. That's what I'm getting to. It, there's multiple okay. components. Okay, so you 
what you buy, what you have to commit to, to buy, is a tower. And they either have the fixed tower that could be hooked up to AC, which that may work for some people, or, or hard, hard line. These are solar towers that we're using because we make them move. Those are about 12 grand, 12 to 15 grand, depending on what, what you're doing. Okay, that's a piece. The trailer that we put on, you can get a trailer for two grand to put it on, to, to make it work. And then you have, I'm, I'm assuming, you know, you're gonna have some labor to, to do it. It's pretty simple. It's just locking it down and, and putting it in. The collars are about $40 each to rent. Okay, you don't buy the collars. So it's a lease on the collars and it's an annual lease. Uh, the battery life on them is the one thing that, that we're seeing, depending on what you're doing. If you're keeping them in a tight little area and there's a lot of audio and sensory cues, battery life's a lot less than if you're in a large landscape. They also, how often are you getting real-time data? If we did five minutes on that. A lot of those studies are going two times a day. And that's a greatly increasing your battery life. It depends on your objective. So then that gets into how long you can leave them out from a, from a cost standpoint. Um, so you're looking at per cow, you know, depending on the size of your operation and how you amortize it over time. You know, I think you probably need two towers. So you're looking at with trailer cost 30 grand. And then you're looking at, uh, you know, minimum of two towers. And then the collars, you're looking at somewhere around $40 to rent those collars um, per head. That's expensive. But, but look at what a fence costs per mile. Yeah. But there's also subscription service on data service, right? We, it, for the cell? Or what? For, for being able to communicate with the cell. If you have cell for service, no, we don't, we don't have, we're not paying any. Yeah, I'm not paying any. It's just talking with, with that modem. I'm trying to think we don't have, um, we're not paying the cell service. If you do, then you're going to have $30 a month or $40 a month. But that's a one time, you know, per tower. I don't think we're doing that right now. I think it's, it's accessing it. I could be wrong. I don't, I don't want to state that. Equivalently, because, but I haven't. I'm pretty sure we don't. I'm pretty sure we don't. Processing fee or no, nope. no. But that's where I'm saying where we, it depends who you are. Because when it gets down to it, we work with that company and we say, okay, we need the number of, of audio and electrical stimulus because we don't have that data. That data is not stored on board. I've got to get that from the company. Uh, the cattle location data, I have to get that from the company, and. Right now, we're not having to pay for that. Um, and I don't think they're charging folks right now as long as you have a certain amount that you're dealing with. Because it does take time for that technician to set up, help you set it up. Once you get uh, comfortable with the technology, I can move fences. I can do that. I can turn collars on and off. I can do it. But we communicate with them before any study we do and talk about what we're wanting to do. And then they make sure we have it set up good and we're golden. Sorry, oh. Dan, if you could repeat the question. Okay, sorry. I apologize for that. Yes. So Jess is asking, as you know, when you have a question, you have stress response to the call. Okay, that's a good question. Um, the, the question was, is there any known effect of the collar stress on meat quality? Nobody's looked at that yet. Um, I'm guessing. My educated guess is going to say no, because I don't think the stress is that much. I think it's pretty transient short term as we saw, um, but that could be something to be looked at just to say no, because that, that question's there. She asked and, you know, could be. Yeah. Back to your fire break uh, study. And presented, you have that same plot on the number of escape routes versus utilization. I just wanted to know that trigger in the trial. Okay, so the question was, um, based on the one slide that I showed for the fire break, do we have a breakdown of the scapees versus non in, in utilization? Or the function of utilization in the fire break. In the fire break, right. Um, I don't know if Rory's done that. 
Um, Rory's the one that was doing that map that that utilization map, and I don't think we've done that. Uh, we do have by utilization area, but we don't have it by those cows. And then, are you are you assuming then that we could determine which cattle we're utilizing? No, no. Like, I mean, you're working in Eastern Oregon. Mm -hmm. You have uh, X axis. It's like days of this stuff. Right. Right. That that scale is going to change here in Montana versus there. Right. right. Precipitation. Like maybe it's consistent. Like well, it's at thirty percent utilization. They start escape. Gotcha. I'm sorry. I, I misunderstood. So the question, the question was, was there a time frame that the cattle started escaping once you hit a, a utilization trigger? We do not have that data because we only did utilization at the front and back end. Okay, so we so we we don't have that data. I okay, I understand you now, and that could be. But I will tell you, in that study, it got progressively worse. But we had three cows that were out every damn day. Um, and so I don't know if it was a calf or whatever, but I'd have to go in because there's a safety code on there for like if we had a fire, you don't want to have cows not wanting to move if there's a fire. So if they hit a certain number that we can program number of cues for audio and sensory, the collar turns off. I have to go in there and turn those three collars on every dang morning, sometimes and night, because they were just either the calf or the cow was getting out. And so there was three or four that were doing it pretty consistent, but by the end of the trial, and I think it, there was some utilization trigger that we did hit, and I don't know what that is, they left. And they wanted to leave and we were at 48 percent and it was near the end so i'm guessing if i had to make an educated guess 35 to 40 percent is where we were hitting probably when they really started to as a group want to leave yeah yeah that's a really good question and one that we had for the company too the question was how precise is that virtual fence line there is some noise, and if anybody's worked with GPS collars, you know you've got some noise around accuracy. You'll hit a bunch of numbers, and then you get one that bounce out. Well, with that line, we're pretty. It, it's within about ten meters of where we can we can get it. Um, it's actually way more precise than we thought. But like with water, for instance, a repairing area, you almost need to move it out because I don't think you could do like one side of a stream and not the other. I don't think it's quite going to be that good. Yeah. So from Darren, program intensity increase will probably be difficult to replace. So if they're out quite a few minutes, the intensity the The question was, can we change by collar the intensity stimulus? We haven't done that. I do think that capability is there. Because you just you go in and you can select a collar and you can change it just like turning it on and off. So we haven't done that. That technology is there, but we haven't looked at that yet. Okay, Tim. Yeah, the question was with the public allotment issue that we have, most people turn out cow calf pairs. And do we need to look at putting collars on calves? That's a possibility, but it gets to what, what I was saying there. That study, and this is where Chad and I've argued a little bit and have a discussion. That study wasn't designed to look at cow calf pairs versus dry cows. Okay, to look at that question, I think we have to, to look at it actually as an objective. And, and I think we'll do that. The other problem that I. No, it, it isn't. We were going to do pairs there. Yeah. 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 Right. And I. Right. They're getting older and I think that's it. But I think the big problem with that fire break. When you're trying to look at that. I would not want if I'm building a fire break. Just for me, not even seeing that data. I don't think pairs are the best option. I think it's stalkers or dry cows or heifers or something, because if you think about it, you're keeping animals in a little narrow strip. And I think Chad will see the same thing with using the rat model data. When you're keeping them in an area, that's a little bit better because it's maybe bigger. I mean, the use we had. Yeah, well, we were hitting 45 and that, you know, that's a little high, but not much. 
I mean, I mean, that's BLM's, you know, landscape. That's not, even though it's a little correlated, that wasn't dry matter use. That was landscape appearance. So that, and that's what BLM's using. And there, we have pretty good ability with that. But the problem that I think that we had with that firebreak study, that was trying to keep a number of cattle in a little area as they ate feed down. Now, in a public land situation, fire break aside, let's say it's a burned area we want to keep them out of. Now, granted, the calf may go in there, but there's going to be a lot of groceries elsewhere where they can maybe keep them out of. And I think the other part was we were starting to lose battery life at the end of that study. So is it that the calf went or did the collars? We lost a third of our collars in that study to batteries. So half of the cows were out. Well, a third of the batteries were gone. Okay, so it, it gets there's a, there's it's not as simple as that graph made it appear is my only statement. So I think we'll see as that how that goes. Variable. Um, I think that's something that they're working on the company, and I think all the companies are, um, and that's been an issue. The, the question was, what's battery life? Um, and I don't know for sure. I'm hoping it's going to be better. This is the first year they sent us batteries. Before the batteries, we didn't take the collars apart. They were set. This year, we got a load of batteries. So we're going to be able to get in, put a new battery in, you know, and who wants to do that on the range? I'm not saying that. But they're looking at it from the standpoint of management. So they're getting there. They're also having a different type of collar. So. We'll see how, how that works, but we've also maybe not been fair to the system because we're doing the 5 minute. Really intensive assessment, they've had it out on public lands in Nevada. For 6 months, and it's still working. Using it a different way than we are. So, twice a day. huh? I think it's twice, twice a day. day. I think it's twice a day. And that gives them a reading of where they are even once a day. It gives them reading where the cattle cow was. Or the animal was. And then, you know, that the virtual fence is working all the time. So, instead of reading and getting a location 5 minutes, doing it again, 5 minutes, then in a fire break situation. They, they're testing it. Multiple times a day versus in a landscape thing, it may be once once a day or once every week that they get to that area and, and hit it. So the battery life would be very different. I don't know what it would be if you put a steady load on it. How long it would last? I I don't know that. So if the is still going, so it's still communicating with people. When yeah, the caller of essentially, I don't know all their capabilities that the company's got, but I can see that it's off and it's not working, and it shows the cow here and she never moves right. On my computer, so it's wrong. I can go in and call uh, the person or texting basically, and he'll go, Yep, I can see it. Collar's not working. Um, it's at this much percent. So he can see the battery percent. He can he can get in there and see, and then it's coming down. They have that technology at home, if you want to think of it that way, the company does, and then they can tell us. But then once it goes totally dead, there's not, you don't see it. But so going back to the cow calf point, so every one of these studies every cow in the area. What would it be like if you had eight? You couldn't do them all. Based on this, you said the half of be restricted to the Yeah, the question was basically how do you know how much of the herd to collar? If it's and to be effective, good question. Stay tuned on that one, because I, I think that's a good question that we look at because it also gets down to, you know, Sam and Tim and Dave Ganskop and I and others have done GPS work and others have done GPS work for a long time with a lot of times 10% or less of the herd collared. Is that representative of the herd? Same thing, money and time dictate you don't know, it's representative of that. So I think on this one though, I do think they're going to need a collar, at least that cow to do it. There is going to be some level of group, but if you keep half of them out, it comes down to your objective. 
Is your objective to keep all of them out? Or is it to reduce use a certain proportion? I, you know, I, I think there are certain things that have to be considered. At that point, um, to make it successful. Yeah. So, say you were able to. Deploy these collars on. The question was, if if we could get to a point where we could put the collars on calves, um, what would that expense be, and and how how could we do it? You know, how long would it work before you'd have to adjust it as they grow? Very good question. That is something that we've actually the other collars that we had those first two versions will not fit calves. That's something we talked about. These I think we can put on a calf, right? But as they grow, to me, I haven't even heard what what the company is recommending, how tight to have these. I cannot imagine they have to be loose. I, I grew up on a dairy. I know what the hell's gonna happen, right? I mean, beef cows out on fence posts, trees, they have the rubber, the plastic little links at the top that'll probably break. And that's probably gonna be a safety thing. So that's that's good. Calf may not be quite strong enough to, to do that. I don't know. But I do believe that I'm hoping there'll be some flexibility to allow that calf to grow and do it if you put it on a calf. This is the first one that we've got that'll fit a calf. We have the exact same questions because Juliana's wanting to use some stuff and do it. And I'm like, okay, what size? What what calf weight are we looking at? Because you know, when from turnout to weaning, that neck's a lot different. And we're gonna have to be. I don't know if it. I'm not going to say no because it's there, but to me, I would not want to have to collar calves. I just, I would try to find a way around that. Um, and I'm hoping that, you know, that cow, we could have something with either intensity, you know, or something where we could figure it out to, to or live with 5%, whatever it is, that is a pain in the rear and, and gut and bust through it, whatever that number could be. Uh, I just think when you look at, Cost and rewards, I, I think the cost is going to be higher on the calf side than the, than keeping it just on the cows or stockers, for instance. Yes, ma'am. Given the potential of being able to use this as a management tool, we see policy will change to recognize it's not an R&D. The prints of themselves aren't an R&D. In some instances, you know, and we'll look at it more from that realistic standpoint of what is an acceptable amount of utilization and escapes perhaps and maybe yeah. given the other benefits that you can get from using this technology. Right. The question was could this technology potentially affect public lands policy and agency policy, I should say, not public lands, agency policy on use of grazing and uh, whatever variable you're looking at for accepted or not. And I hope so. I have had, and not just me, that there, there is a tremendous amount of interest that people have been contacted primarily, well, it, 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 it's BLM and Forest Service. Both groups from multiple states in the West have reached out to us and others about the potential here and how it could work because they want to provide that flexibility. I don't, we're, what, I can't speak for them on, you know, if it's an iron, any use is bad, right? I mean, however we look, if you're looking at nymphs or, you know, or whatever it may be, um, Noah, you know, how, however we, we get into that, those are the ones that I think if we can show we're making an effort, and that's why we're wanting to look at the, basically we're looking at MIM protocol uh, variables, bank height, our bank height, bank alteration, stubble height, and, and, and current year shrub use. If we can show that we can reduce that use with the collars, why wouldn't they? You know, I mean, then it becomes, then they've got to justify. I think it puts the, the argument on the other foot. Instead of being defensive, we say, look what we can do. Because we already have the ability to use it. Now we're providing a tool that is going to potentially extend our use or maybe even help that. 
you know, that restoration process, process or that management process, that trend, that long-term trend, whatever we're, we're looking at. I'm hoping that that will help us get into that question because right now it's, it's like a no-go. You know, you hit, you hit seven-inch double height, you're gone. You hit 20% bank alteration, you're gone. 40%, you're gone, shrub use, you can't, you can't be in there. Doesn't matter if it's ilk, doesn't matter whatever, because we need more tools like this, I think. And that's where I think the cost share comes in, because those agencies are there. They, I know there's opinions vary, but I think for the most part, those agencies want to help and, and graze and manage those allotments properly. This is a tool that's gonna allow them to do it. And instead of fighting fire, instead of, doing whatever, if we can do this, it's way more economical. That, that's my, I, I, so I rambled a lot because I don't know, but I'm with you. I know where you're coming from and I hope it's the same. I, I, I really think this is gonna change the way we do some things because especially like in that Nevada study, the BLM and Forest Service are all part of it. They're part of it. Uh, 